Welcome to the Bias Buzz special edition. Today I'm pleased to be joined by a special guest, Hans von Spakovsky from the Heritage Foundation. Hans is an authority on a wide range of issues, including civil rights, civil justice, the First Amendment, immigration, the rule of law, and government reform. As a senior legal fellow at the Heritage Foundation's Edwin Meese uh, Center for Legal and Just Judicial Studies, he's the co-author with John Fund of the book Who's Counting? How Fraudsters and Bureaucrats Put Your Vote at Risk and Obama's enforcer, Eric Holder's Justice Department. Uh, before joining Heritage in 2008, uh, Hans served two terms, two years, sorry, as a member of the Federal Election Commission, uh, the authority charged with enforcing campaign finance laws for congressional and presidential elections, including public funding. Good morning and welcome, Hans. Well, thanks for having me. Thank you for it. Thank you for coming in. All right, so let's just, the first question I'm gonna ask is just, give me your uh, idea of what's going on here in the elections, and then we'll talk about the rest of the stuff. <laughs> uh, well, look, because I deal a lot with election integrity issues, I mean, that's my biggest concern. You know, not the politics of the, of the race, but, but making sure that actually wh whichever candidate gets the most votes is, is actually declared the winner. And I say that because, look, we've had recent uh, cases and evidence surfing, surfacing across the country of, of many problems. Uh, Many non-citizens have been found on the rolls in Philadelphia and Virginia. Uh, Pennsylvania and Virginia are both battleground states, right? Uh, we don't know who's going to win, win those states. Um, uh, 20 individuals who were dead, uh, someone attempted to register them to vote, also in Virginia. Uh, uh, a, a, an investigation in Colorado showed that um, uh, people who were dead who were on the rolls have been casting ballots, including in the latest election. Same thing in California. Uh, just last week, a woman was arrested in New York State, uh, a Canadian citizen here illegally. Uh, she's voted in 20 prior American elections, including most recently the presidential primary. So all over the country we have evidence of bad voter registration rolls and a system filled with loopholes that allows people who are are not eligible to vote to, to vote. Could, could they make the difference in a close election? Well, we don't know. Well, okay, and that's, that's good. That's a good overview here, too. Now, I did decide it just to try to be a little more balanced, in a sense, or at least to play the devil's advocate just for a second. So the Brennan Center for uh, Justice, which I'm sure you're right. very familiar with, right. what they say is that fraud is uh, vanishingly rare and does not happen happen on a, a scale even close to that necessary to rig an election. You know, now, my general reaction to this is just that any voter fraud is bad. The right. yeah, one case is one case too many. Right. I mean, so how do you, I mean, what do you have to say? I mean, do you have anything more to say about that in terms of? Yeah, I, I'll put it to you this way. Look, the, the, the actual convictions that you see for voter fraud are just the tip of the iceberg. The reason being that it's it's hard to it's hard to discover, and even when it is, uh, prosecutors uh, have a tendency not to, not to prosecute it. Uh, we started a database about a year and a half ago at Heritage of just recent cases. So these are not newspaper articles where somebody says, well, I think something happened. These are cases where individuals are actually convicted in a court of law for engaging in voter fraud. We're up to over 400 cases from across the country. And for those who say, um, well, it's not going to have any effect, um, look, the, the place that could make the difference is in a close election. And again, let's go back to Virginia for just a second. Um, the Public Interest Legal Foundation just released a report saying that they found over 1,000 non-citizens in just eight counties in the state uh, who were illegally on the rolls. Uh, many of them voted in prior elections. Um, 1,000 non-citizens just in eight counties. Uh, just three years ago, the statewide attorney general's race in the state of Virginia was decided by under 200 votes. So it's very possible that these uh, non-citizens voting illegally in the election uh, could have made the difference. And the thing is, while those 1,000 voters uh, have now been taken off the voter rolls by election officials, guess what the election officials did not do? They didn't turn those files over to law enforcement for prosecution. So there's 1,000 possible cases of voter fraud that will never show up in any Brennan Center report because it wasn't turned over to law enforcement to even look at. Yeah, now I used to be on the uh, board of uh, Election Integrity Maryland, and mm -hmm. so we were looking at a lot of these things, and you know they would, you would, they would pay to get 
uh, voter registration information from the state right. board and everything like that. Uh, the frustration we had was just that when we when checking these things, these names and, and all these things, getting it back to the state, the state was very resistant to, to, do, to do, do anything, anything about it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Right. I, yeah. How familiar are you with? I mean, there's. I guess the voter registration rules laws are different really from state to state. How familiar are you with these? Because one of the things that, you know, that gets to me is that, for exa- I live in Maryland. Uh, my daughter is now 30 years old and she's living in Indiana. She's previously lived in Iowa. She previously lived uh, in, in Utah. Uh, she's still on the Maryland books. Uh, r- books. And I, apparently the only way to get her off is that she has to actually physically write a letter to them and tell them that she wants to be removed. But how many people are likely to do that? Uh, I guess technically she could vote in two places, though that would be illegal. But t- you know, what are the chances that she would get caught? I mean, how many times? The, is the, the chances are very minimal. Uh, there have been a number of convictions in, in recent years of people uh, who voted illegally in both states. And, and I would remind you, um, how bad is it? Well, remember in Maryland just a couple of years ago, a, uh, a can- congressional candidate in the Democratic primary had to withdraw from the race after uh, opposition research was done by her, I think, I think by a fellow Democratic candidate, and they discovered that she had voted in both Maryland and Florida at the same time. Oh, I remember Ill- that. Well, yeah, right, right. Um, and that would never have been discovered except for the fact that she ran for office and someone did opposition research on her. If it hadn't been for that, she wouldn't have, uh, she wouldn't have been caught. Yeah, so you know we the the Virginia thing was down in Harrisonburg at and involved what involved students or just people down in Harrisonburg and and the, the guy over there was from James Madison. You want to explain yeah. that to me yeah, a little bit? Yeah, more? there were 20, uh, 20 voter registrations came in from a particular group. There was a student involved in helping to do it, and um, one of the election officials noticed that uh, one of the individuals individuals being registered was the father of a very prominent local judge. And she knew that that person was dead. So if it hadn't been for the registrar having that personal knowledge, these 20 registrations would have gone into the system and those individuals would have been registered. Now some say, okay, well, so some people who were dead would have gotten registered. But the point is, um, if they had been registered then, uh, the person who did it or anyone else who knew they were dead would have had the opportunity, for example, to request absentee ballots in their names and, and submit them and get 20 votes for someone else. Remember, just a couple of years ago, uh, a woman in, in Ohio, Meloise Richardson, was convicted for voting five or six times for Barack Obama. And when she came out of prison, she was welcomed as a hero for having done that, uh, there was a big rally going on there that Al Sharpton was at. They welcomed her with open arms, treated someone who had, who had uh, committed felonies as a hero. Why? Because she'd been able to get in five or six votes for candidates that they supported. <laughs> well, that's pretty incredible. Uh, you know, I don't want to s- spend a whole lot of time necessarily in Virginia, but what, about, what are your thoughts about, you know, the governor and the, the felons being given a right to vote and everything like that. Does right. how, how does that muddle the situation? What's, what's the implications of all that? Uh, I, I do think that the governor of Virginia is, is still violating the Virginia Constitution. Uh, the, the situation in Virginia is basically this. Uh, once you're convicted of a felony, uh, you lose your right to vote. You can get it back, but you have to apply to the governor's office. Uh, they are supposed to check your record. Uh, Virginia always had a waiting period. You know, they wanted to wait a couple of years to, to see if you really had turned over a new leaf. And, it, and, it, and if all that got approved, then your voting rights could be restored. Um, Terry McAuliffe came in and said, uh, we, I don't want to do any of that. I'm just going to issue a blanket restoration to all the felons in, in the state. I'm not going to check their records. I'm not going to see if they haven't uh, turned over a new leaf. And that's what he's been doing. And uh, the problem with that is um, two-thirds of felons are back in prison within three years, three-quarters within five years. So having a waiting period is actually a good idea. But th- the point is they know Virginia is a state that could go either way in the election, and they want to be sure that the state goes their way. So he's willing to violate the state constitution in order to get felons back on the rolls because he hopes uh, that they will vote for his party and his candidate. All right, so 
you know, the another big issue that comes up, you know, that's parallel to this, obviously, is is voter ID, and I know you're very right. familiar with all these voter ID laws that have now there's some that are in have been in effect for a number of years, and I, I they're working as far as we know, yes, uh, very well. Uh, but a ma there are majority of the states don't really have that, and there's been some rollback, I guess, in North Carolina. The courts have really, the, the liberals have done, have been able to achieve some things in trying to roll some of those things back, or at least, you know, slow them down to an extent. This kind of bothers me from the personal sense of having worked polls before. Is just when people come in, I, g I believe in Maryland or at least in Montgomery County where I live. You can't ask anybody for ID. I mean, you know, right. the, the judges always remind the poll workers that would be illegal to ask them for their ID. Uh, you know, if they're, but if you suspect that you know they're a little bit confused about where if they're in the right place or whether they really should be voting, I mean, that would help clear this up. You could see a license or some kind of government issued ID that say, oh, okay, well you're okay, but you know, I mean, the liberals seem to argue that. You know, uh, there's a there's a subset of the population, or uh, you know, the the poor, the minorities, whatever, can't get that ID. So you know, this is a disenfranchisement. This is uh, you know, liberals have called this uh, a poll tax. I mean, I, I know you've heard it all. Give me your thoughts. Uh, that is a that is a narrative myth that they've been pushing in the media. Um, look, the average American knows they need an ID for constantly all the time every day for so many different things and that's why actually the polling shows that a majority of Americans think there's nothing nothing wrong I think they, they think it's common sense to require an ID uh, for voting and that's a majority of white Americans black Americans Hispanics uh, and a majority of Republicans Democrats and, and independents um, the uh, every state that's passed an ID law like this has put in a provision saying if you don't have one we'll provide one for you free the data on this shows that the percentage of Americans who don't already have a photo ID is a, a tiny percentage. In um, Georgia, which put in a photo ID law starting in the 2008 election, they actually keep track of the numbers of uh, how many people have to come in and get a free ID. The average um, for the first, uh, I think, six years of the uh, law being in place was uh, five one hundredths of one percent of the number of registered voters had to come in and get an ID, and that's because look, you all know this. If you want to, if you want to go in and buy a beer, you need an ID. You, if you want to go see your doctor, they require a, a photo ID when you set up your first appointments. Um, if you want to get on an airplane, you need an ID. If you want to get into certain government buildings, you need an ID. In many places, if you want to apply for uh, Medic Medicaid, uh, I'm sorry, for uh, public assistance, welfare, you need an ID. Um, folk, opponents always say, oh, well, you know, um, buying a beer isn't a constitutional right, and you shouldn't have to show an ID to exercise a constitutional right. But on the other hand, uh, you want to exercise your Second Amendment right to buy a gun, you're not going to be able to do it without a photo ID. Or uh, well, one final example is... Um, Look, the, the U.S. Supreme Court said in the early 1960s in, in, a, in a case called uh, Virginia versus Loving that uh, the right to marry is a fundamental civil right. And, I, and, and the courts uh, have recently, as you know, the Supreme Court has agreed with that. The right to marry is a fundamental civil right. Uh, you can check the website of just about any place uh, you live, and you go and see what it requires to get a marriage license, and you'll find that in many places, not only do they require a government-issued photo ID, they often require a second ID uh, just to get a marriage license. Yeah. So let me let me ask you about this then too. There's you know, Donald Trump has been talking a lot about the system is rigged. I mean, I guess he's really referring to also you know maybe the election will be rigged. That you know he, if he loses, I, I, part of it I, I mean tends to think that's this his way of just just kind of paving the path in case he does lose, that he can point to certain things right. as, as, as the blame uh, and not for his own, anything that he, have, he has done as a candidate that may have failed him. But within the last month or two, I mean, John Lewis, Representative John Lewis, you know, he said that uh, he, he's basically, he was, said he was concerned about the fairness of the election and he thought it would be fitting for the Department of Justice and others in the administration to look at the possibility of appointing federal observers in several states. When I first saw this, I was kind of, I don't know, I guess I kind of chuckled a little bit that you've got this very prominent Democrat all of a sudden talking about, 
you know, he was worried that maybe the elections would not be fair and everything like that. But I think at that point in time, he was worried that, that Trump was going to run the table. Uh, I don't know that he's still saying that today because it seems the momentum may have shifted the other direction. But, I mean, what do you think about that? Uh, this is the same John Lewis that has uh, made all kinds of false claims ab uh, against photo ID laws, despite the fact that his own state has had a photo ID law in place for almost a decade with none of the problems that he claims would happen if you had a photo ID law. Uh, the federal observers in our election polling places, uh, this Justice Department cannot be trusted to act in a unbiased, nonpartisan uh, manner. They, uh, they have waged a war against election integrity, suing to try to stop photo ID. Uh, they have uh, uh, also engaged in litigation trying to stop states from verifying the citizenship of people who are registered to vote, uh, and they have refused to actually um, prosecute individuals who are not U.S. citizens uh, for registering and voting. I know that personally because uh, five years ago when I was on a local county election board in Virginia, we also discovered that about 300 non-citizens were registered on, in our county. About half of them had voted in prior elections. We took them off the rolls and we sent it sent the cases to the U.S. Justice Department for prosecution. They did absolutely nothing about it. Which goes back to the points that you were talking about. I mean, they just won't do anything, they, neither the state election board or anybody else. They, right. they, they just they want to kind of push that under the rug and everything like that. What effect, you know, has Motor Voter had on all of this as well? I mean, I, I know we had it in Maryland, and I'm not a big fan of it, but. Well, I, I, Motor Voter is a mixed bag. On the one hand, I think the provisions it put in that said that uh, when you go get your driver's license, you can also register to vote, uh, that, that's a good idea. Okay? But the bad part of, of uh, the motor voter law was that it severely restricted the ability of election officials to clean up their roles. And one of the reasons we have so many um, people who are still dead on the rolls, people who have moved to other states, is because they, the motor voter put in these very cumbersome rules uh, making it extremely difficult to remove people from the from the rolls. And so election officials all over the country, even when they want to clean them up, they're scared to do it because they're afraid they're going to get sued by the Obama Justice Department or civil rights groups saying, well, you, you didn't file, uh, you didn't follow these rules. Uh, the best example of this is a couple of years ago when uh, Florida <laughs> uh, discovered non-citizens on their rolls and started taking them off the rolls. Now, these are people who were ineligible to be on there in the first place. And do you know that um, uh, civil rights organizations filed suit to stop that, and they got a, some very, very uh, stupid federal judges to say, no, you, you can't take these people off. It's pretty incredible. It, it, it is. All right. We have a, uh, a question that was submitted on Facebook from uh, Jerry in Bethesda. So he want to know, why should representatives from states with voter integrity recognize representatives in either the House or the Senate from states where it is easy, if not encouraged, for illegals to vote, such as Maryland and California? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that is, uh, that, that does bring up a good question. Well, all I can say about that is, you know, constitutionally, um, uh, the Constitution says that each House of Congress is the judge of the qualifications of its own members. So if, if some member of Congress will actually wanted to bring that up, they, they would have the ability to do it. I, I, don't think, uh, they, I don't think other members of Congress would touch this because they'd be too afraid of the um, uh, bad, supposedly bad publicity, but they actually, they actually could raise that as an issue. All right. Well, one final question then. What is your solution to the problem? Uh, First of all, every state needs to pass a photo ID law that applies both to in-person voting and absentee balloting. Second, states need to uh, pass laws that uh, require proof that you are a United States citizen when you register to vote. Uh, third, um, the Department of Homeland Security, which of course has a huge database of non-citizens who are in the U.S., and that's people who are here legally, and people who are here illegally who have been uh, arrested or detained at some point and therefore have gotten into the system, uh, they need to quit 
trying to prevent states from getting access to that system so they can use it to check the citizenship status of people on, on their roles. Th th those are just basic steps uh, that could be taken that would uh, vastly improve the situation we have right now. Okay, well then maybe one more. So what are the odds of that? <laughs> uh, well, some of that depends on uh, who, who next is in the White House and is running the administration, but it also depends greatly on uh, who federal judges are, who gets to appoint federal judges, because we've got now a lot of bad federal judges appointed by this president who will throw out any voter ID law regardless of the facts or the law. All right. Well, great. Thank you so much for coming in today and joining me today to talk about this very important issue. And uh, for those of you that are watching, and we'll see this a little bit later, please, you know, follow Hans, uh, you know, at Heritage Foundation. He's written a lot of great stuff, continues to do so, and you, I know you do a lot of other public appearances. So uh, you've, we've got a real expert here, and we're, we're just delighted to have him. And then uh, join us next week after the debate, the next Thursday, as we do our regular podcast, and we'll analyze the final presidential debate. Thanks a lot, and see you next week.